name's Cal Cothrade, and I'm a professional photographer, a fine artist, and a technical diver. And I want to thank you all for spending time out of your busy lives to sit and uh, listen to shipwrecks, uh, listen to me talk about shipwrecks. I really appreciate you choosing to spend a little time with me tonight. Um, I, live in, I lived in southeastern Wisconsin, a uh, suburb of Milwaukee, actually, for all my life until last fall when my wife and I said enough with the snow and we left and we uh, moved to South Carolina. So I'm actually coming to you from South Carolina tonight, but I'd like you to think of me as a hometown local boy, okay? Uh, I've also spent the last two decades and nearly all of my disposable income traveling North America, photographing shipwrecks. It's really kind of an obsession slash passion. And uh, most of that, most of those were in the Great Lakes, but somewhere on the oceans as well. And tonight is a primer about Great Lakes shipwrecks. We're gonna talk about why there are so many of them, how they got there. And I'm gonna share some photos with you of 10 really interesting uh, vessels that became shipwrecks. And they really sort of showcase the diversity in the types of ships and boats that were plying the Great Lakes in the 18th, uh, or in the 1800s, in the early 1900s. And then after we take a look at those 10 vessels in detail and what they look like today underwater, of course, um, then I'm going to hang around. I'm going to answer any questions that you've got at all about what we talked about tonight as far as Great Lakes or invasive species or shipwrecks or scuba diving or photography. Anything's fair game. And I just want you all to remember the only bad question is the one left unasked. So with that being said, uh, we have a lot to cover. So let's just dive in. In July of 1679, French explorer Robert LaSalle made history in a way I'm pretty sure he didn't intend. He launched a vessel that would become the first shipwreck ever on the upper Great Lakes. LaSalle's bark, a 45 ton wooden sailing ship named Griffin was constructed at the mouth of Cayuga Creek in Western New York. Now, even though you all know where Cayuga Creek is, I'm gonna just mention that it uh, it's about three miles up river from Niagara Falls, just to be clear. It was one of the very first European built vessels on the Great Lakes. And only a few months later in mid-September, when it left Washington Island in Wisconsin Store County on a fair summer day, it vanished forever into the pages of history. The vessel along with its cargo of furs, crew of five and five cannons were never seen or heard from again. Now the Griffin has yet to be positively identified or found, and it is generally considered to be the holy grail of Great Lakes shipwrecks. And though it was the first shipwreck on the upper Great Lakes, it sure wouldn't be the last. Since then, it's estimated that maybe as many as 6,000 vessels have made their way to the bottom of the lakes, collective body of water so large that they represent 21% of the earth's fresh water. They have nicknames reflective of their size too, like the Big Five and Third Coast. They're really more inland seas than they are lakes. They're so massive in fact that they manufacture their own weather and their storms can be as deadly to man and ship as anything on the world's oceans. So traveling by boat on the Great Lakes certainly was not to be taken lightly 340 years ago during LaSalle's time not 100 years ago, and certainly not today either. Maybe you're still pondering that number I just gave you a minute ago, 6,000. Wow, why are there so many wrecks? I mean, what's causing all these ships to sink? Is it some kind of weird, weird Bermuda Triangle thing up here in the Great Lakes? No, not really. But in order to understand the answers to these questions, you have to realize that in the 1800s, when the Midwest was really starting to expand and blossom and everybody was moving here, there were no interstates. I mean, there were no semi trucks and the roads that they did have were quite poor. So the fastest, easiest, cheapest way to move people and goods was by ship. Nearly everything moved by way of lakes and rivers. Thousands of vessels from small schooners all the way up to large steamers. And they're all trying to get from point A to point B, from this port to that port, and do it as quickly as possible. Because, of course, time is money, and that was just as true back then. So now throw into the pot vicious summer squalls, uh, hurricane winds, monster rogue waves, dense fog, and even whiteout snowstorms. 
add in an equal amount of human error, captain's misjudgment, and of course, profit-driven corporate greed. Yes, that existed back then too. Stir everything pretty vigorously, top off with an icing of no GPS, no radar, no weather forecasting, and in the early days, not even radio. And what you've got is a recipe for disaster, lives and ships lost. Whether it be ship-to-ship -ship collision, running aground, catching fire, sinking from just plain disrepair and neglect, or being overtaken by massive waves, or perhaps running into large sheets of ice. There's a lot of ways to sink a ship on the Great Lakes. And thus, over the decades, a museum of maritime history has been slowly assembled on the bottom of the Great Lakes. Archaeological gems, each of them virtually frozen in time, there are few comparable examples of sites on dry land that are just so pristine and undisturbed, except for maybe a tomb or a cave that's yet to be found or plundered. Oftentimes, divers are really lucky, and we get to see the uh, we get to see these these time capsules when we go underwater and we dive. We can see the everyday items that our ancestors used, like the coffee pots the stoves that warmed that last pot of coffee, the dishes they ate their last meal from, the tools they used, and even the clothing that they wore. Diving on a wreck is like going back in time. Well, in order to do that, we need to breathe underwater. And man's been trying to do that for hundreds of years using various contraptions, as you can see from some of these illustrations. Fortunately, in 1943, Another Frenchman, one that you probably have heard of by the name of Jacques Cousteau, helped invent something called the demand regulator. It was a device which significantly increased bottom times and opened the floodgates for what would become a new sport and ultimately a multi-billion dollar industry worldwide. Today, with advancements in equipment, such as rebreathers, like the one being demonstrated and worn by my good friend and dive buddy Steve Weimer II here in this photo. With the, with the advance in, advancements in equipment such as that, uh, divers can now go safer, uh, can go deeper and, and stay longer and do it safely than ever, more than ever before. Um, and it's just opened up even more depths of the water to, uh, to divers. But photographing shipwrecks is one of my passions and so one piece of equipment I almost never go diving without is my camera because uh, it, that that's just what I'm crazy about is, is photographing shipwrecks and then showing those photos to folks like you. So now that we know why so many ships go to the bottom, we can take a look at some photos that, like I said before, really exemplify the diversity in all those different kinds of Great Lakes uh, vessels. And then at the same time, get to showcase some of their haunting beauty as they are today as shipwrecks. We're gonna start off in Georgian Bay, which is a part of Lake Huron. It's all the same water, it's connected. They just call it Georgian Bay. And uh, we're gonna talk about the steamer Manasu. Here's a nice picture of the Manasu. Now, after being laid up and put away for the winter, done with her, her shipping season, the passenger steamer Manasu was brought out of mothballs, put into service for one last run of the year to bring 100 plus head of cattle back to the mainland from Manitoulin Island. Less than, 12, less than 12 hours into the trip home, the weather started to kick up and the ship with 21 souls aboard began to list or lean to one side. Within minutes, she rolled over onto her side completely and then very quickly slid below the waves stern first. And as she raced to the bottom 210 feet below, the captain, some of the crew, and the owner of the cattle that brought the, you know, the, whole, the whole reason for this final trip of the year were busy floating in a life raft, freezing cold and wet for two and a half days before they got rescued. Apparently, when they launched and got in their lifeboat, the winds were blowing them east all the way across Georgian Bay. And just before they made it to shore, the winds, oddly enough, switched around 180 degrees almost and blew them nearly back to the origin of the whole, where the whole ordeal began. So that's why they were in a lifeboat for two and a half days. Uh, 
Well, it's suspected that the herd of cattle broke loose from their pen and all that shifting weight is what caused the vessel to sink in the first place besides the storm. Now, before we look at the underwater photos, if you can see my cursor on the black and white photo, we're gonna point out a few things on the, the ship that we're gonna look at underwater. Namely, these four lifeboats that were stored up on top of these cabins here. Also, these square openings on the side of the vessel those were cargo hatches. They could load their bulk cargo in and out uh, very easily through those doors, and then they would button those up once they're underway. Also, she has a single smokestack here, and then this really cool round little uh, part of the structure here. It's called the pilot house. That's where the captain and the helmsman would have been standing and controlling the boat from. And also from the pilot house deck down to the weather deck is this beautiful staircase with railings. and. Uh, it's, it's just amazing as a shipwreck that the, all that stuff is still there. As we can see in this photo, she's coming straight at us. This is 210 feet down in Lake, uh, in Georgian Bay. And it's just, it's, it's phenomenal that the condition this thing is in. Uh, it sank in 1928. So it's been on the bottom for 96, 94 years. And, um, the railings and the stairs are still there. And so is this wood pilot house and the, the cabins below. Very rare because these wood structures on top of the main deck usually get blown off when the ships sink due to oftentimes built up air pressure. It can be explosive. It can be like a stick of dynamite. There's many, many newspaper reports from survivors of Great Lakes shipwrecks who were just peppered with wood splinters when these, these uh, cabins or whatever would explode as the vessel was going down and all that air pressure just uh, was too much. So the fact that this is still here is maybe a testament to how well it was made, maybe a testament to uh, how slowly it sank, not exactly sure, possibly a, a little bit of both, but it's still here and it's a rarity and we're, we're enjoying it. So walk up in your mind, walk up these steps, holding on to the railings with both hands, of course, and I want you to stand right in front of this front window and I want you to stand on your tippy toes and just peer over the ledge inside and that's what you're going to see. There's the ship's wheel. This beautiful um, helm is in perfect condition, not a spoke or a handle missing or out of place. Even a red and I want to say blue, like a dark blue, might be black. Uh, her paint is still in place. Um, and in front, right at the base of the window here is her compass. So if you were to wipe the silt off of this, you would see the compass in there. Now that you're up here, I want you to crawl through the window if you can and stand behind the wheel and think of yourself as the helmsman on this fateful voyage. The ship is in mortal peril. The waves are, are huge. The rain is coming down sideways. The wind is blowing and the ship is, is clearly going down. You may or may not have minutes to live uh, and you just happen to look to your left to see what time it is. And um, there it is, the clock on the wall, still after nearly a century. Although the hands have rusted away, we can still see some rust stains on that white clock face, probably showing us where they might have been for decades. Um, these are the kind of details that we were talking about earlier, about pristine, frozen in time kind of time capsules. Um, when a ship goes down, everything stops. And if nobody loots it or plunders it, it's still there for divers to look at. The vessel had four lifeboats. One was used by the survivors. The other three went to the bottom of the lake. One is actually physically sitting on the bottom of the lake back at the stern, and the other two are still where they roughly where they would have been stowed when they're underway on top of the cabin roofs. This one here in the background has been crushed by the smokestack when the smokestack fell on it at some point. But the other remaining lifeboat, the one in the foreground, is the one that I really wanted to talk about because look at the handwriting on that leading edge of the bow that's called the cut water the very leading edge of a vessel and this wood lifeboat somebody had the the wherewithal to write in paint probably uh some measurements l probably for length probably 22 or probably looks like 23 feet b for beam six and six foot six inches sounds about right d for depth to something and then all these pesky little 
things here. These are quagga mussels. They're an invasive species and they're covering every everything, every almost every inch of everything. We're going to see a lot of quagga mussels tonight. We're going to talk about them later, but um, they're, they're sort of obscuring what was also written there. I'm not sure what these other measurements would have been, but it was important to somebody to write that so that it was always readily available at a moment's notice. And there it is a century later for us to look at. Very cool. So another thing that went down with the ship besides the 100 plus head of cattle was the owner of the cattle, his one-year-old Chevy two-door coupe. He had purchased a 1927 Chevy coupe and he was shipping it back to the mainland along with the cattle. And that vessel or that car went down with the vessel. Um, here, Steve Weimer, my dive buddy, is photographing it through part of that loading hatch that we saw earlier. Here's a better look at that car. You know what, considering that this thing went through a very rough and, and bumpy ride and then uh, flipped onto the boat, flipped onto its side and then flipped stern first down and took a 210 foot ride and then crashed into the bottom lake. Here on, I I'm thinking this car is in pretty good shape yet, considering it's been through all that. Also look at the bow tie Chevy bow tie emblem on the grill. Just, just like the day it came off the showroom floor. Pretty cool. So that was the Manasu, one of the really nicest wrecks I've ever dove. Um, that was the last most most recent wreck, uh, new, new to me wreck that I dove. Anyways, we're gonna stay in Lake Huron, Georgian Bay waters, and we're gonna move up to the tip of this little spit of land here. This peninsula is called the Bruce Peninsula. It's part of Ontario, Canada. And up at the very tip is a little town called Tobermory. And Tobomori has some great diving. And one of the wrecks there is the Bark Arabia, which unfortunately I don't have a photo of. You know, not every ship uh, or boat had its photo taken, especially in the 1800s. And um, this one was lost in 1884. So cameras were really, really a new thing. They were a very expensive piece of equipment. Obviously, everybody wasn't walking around with the iPhone or their uh, Samsung in their pocket. And so if there was ever a photo taken of the Bark Arabia, it's unknown to maritime historians and it may be sitting in somebody's attic or maybe lost in a library somewhere, I don't know. But uh, nobody's found one yet. At any rate, it was a two-masted sailing ship. It was bringing corn from Chicago to Midland, Ontario when it got caught in a fierce storm near Tobomori. The crew manned the pumps for 18 hours before they finally gave up on their ship and they launched their yawl boat, which is just a fancy term for a rowboat or a lifeboat on a sailing ship. They rowed to the safety of a very nearby island. It was known as Echo Island, but it's now also called Horse Island because it's in reference to the several horses that were aboard the Arabia when it sank and they swam to the island uh, to save their lives as well and they lived out the rest of their lives on on Echo Island, so it's also called Horse Island. Uh, the wreck went down, as I said, in 1884, and in 1985, there was a stone memorial placed on the bottom of the lake near the wreck, and we're gonna take a look at that in just a second, to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the loss. <clears throat> so here she is, a wooden sailing ship coming straight at us, Pretty good condition, uh, bow sprit, jib boom still in place, some standing rigging. These things here are called bob stay chains. She's got two big anchors, her anchor chains are still there. And you may be wondering why the photo is in black and white. Well, sometimes, you know, as a photographer, I think if you remove the color from an image, the, uh, the highlights and the shadows and the texture really plays a bigger part. And uh, you can really appreciate the sweeping lines to a ship that way sometimes. But if you really must see this in color, let's just swim underneath the uh, bowsprit to the other side. That's what it looked like the day I dove it. Um, we can see one of her masts has fallen away. She's uh, It's laying on top of the port rail. And uh, we're gonna take a closer look at that mast that has something that's kind of interesting still on it. That's these wood sticks. Uh, this is called the trestle tree or what you might think of as a crow's nest. That's where the lower mast and the upper mast join together. Um, not always still on uh, shipwrecks in the Great Lakes, so always nice to see that when we do. Also, there's rigging blocks all over this uh, shipwreck. There's one right here. And also in the background, 
about 20 feet away from the camera is the windlass, which is like a big winch mechanism that would, its pr primary uh, use was for raising and lowering the uh, very heavy anchors and, and anchor chain, but it was also used for other heavy lifting when they needed it. And also those big heavy anchors, let's take a look at those. I mean, when you think of an anchor uh, in your mind's eye, this is pretty much it right here, right? Giant wood stock, uh, big steel fluked anchor portion, and they're still in the exact position they would have been when it was underway, stowed uh, right there on the rail and the cat head, uh, supported by the cat head here. So uh, they didn't even get a chance to, to try and bother to drop an anchor. Now, if we swim a little bit away from the bow, we can see the anchors up in the in, way in the distance here. We're probably 40, 50 feet away from the bow at this point. Uh, very good visibility on this dive, by the way. We've got this giant box, this wood box here in the right front part of our picture. That's a centerboard trunk. Uh, sailboats have, you know, that fin thing hanging on the bottom of the boat. Technically, it's either a, a keel or it's a centerboard, depending on the type of boat. And if it, if it can be swung up into this pocket, uh, then, you know, winched up, then what that does is it allows the crew and the boat to get into maybe a shallower harbor or a little further up the river to get to that customer that the other big boats can't get because the water's not deep enough and they draw too much depth. Um, so this was a pretty common thing on schooners uh, lake schooners during the during the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. Also, we got a nice shot of her mast laying across the port rail there. And of course, another beautiful double sheaved rigging block right here in the foreground. Little gems that us wreck divers like to see. This is way back at the stern. We're about 110 feet deep here at this point. Um, Steve is taking a photograph of the helm, which has fallen away and is sort of laying kind of on the bottom of the lake here. And here's that concrete memorial commemorating the 100th anniversary of her loss. We're going to leave uh, Lake, lake here on all together, and we're going to go up to Lake Superior, the big lake they call Gichigumi, which, um, of course, Gordon Lightfoot sort of coined it that in his a very famous ballad uh, about the Edmund Fitzgerald. And actually, um, as luck would have it, today is November 10th. And 47 years ago tonight, those 29 men aboard the Edmund Fitzgerald were fighting for their lives. And we all know how that worked out. Unfortunately, uh, they paid the ultimate price as many mariners did. And um, so I'd like to just take five seconds here and just remember the, those 29 men tonight on the 47th anniversary of the loss of the Great Lakes freighter Edmund Fitzgerald. Thank you, I appreciate you assisting me with that. Okay, we are in Lake Superior. Uh, we're at Isle Royale. It's a 45 mile long island. It's the largest island and the largest of the Great Lakes. And it is, in. The entire island is a national park. It's very remote. There are no towns, there are no roads, and there are a lot of shipwrecks all around it. And we're gonna take a look at one right now called the Henry Chisholm, which was lost in 1898 uh, when it ran aground on a reef. She had just left Duluth on her way to Buffalo, New York. Hit a storm. She weathered the storm okay, but she had been towing another vessel. And they felt that they may not make it through the storm if they didn't cut the other vessel loose during the storm. So they cut that 220 foot boat that they were towing behind them loose. And then after the storm passed, they spent two days motoring around trying to find it. And while they were doing that, they ran aground on a uh, rock reef called uh, at the, uh, it was near the Rock of Ages lighthouse. And much of the vessel was sitting on top of that rock reef, sort of stuck there for uh, a while, and they were able to salvage some of it before a week later, another storm came along and um, it, they, it, the, 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 another, the other storm basically put it on the bottom is what happened. They took it off the reef and she sank. 
So we're going to take a look at the double expansion steam engine that powered this vessel, even though you see sails here. This is a crossover. This is when they still weren't really very uh, willing to put any stock into steam powered boats and they still wanted to have sails in case something happened to the engine, which this vessel I'm sure loaded down with 92,000 bushels of barley at the time of her sinking would not have sailed very far under sail, but uh, that made them feel a little bit better. Very shortly after this time period, they did away with those sails altogether. And, and obviously they started you know, trusting the, uh, the steam engines that were powering these vessels at the time. So anyways, this vessel uh, set a lot of cargo capacity records during her 18 year career. And we're going to take a look at the engine, which would have been housed right back here, right now. Uh, this is the stern, the very stern. This is the propeller. And this is about 140 feet down in Lake Superior. It's uh, on the bottom, of course, rocky bottom. And that propeller looks a little funny. If it does, then you are very perceptive and astute because it is not the way it should be. It's missing one and a half blades. And this is a direct result of the propeller turning as they ran into the rock reef. Rock reefs always trump ships uh, and propellers. So uh, my, my friend Scott is standing on the bottom of Lake Superior and he's showing you that there is a blade missing here and part of one missing here. And also how big it is. It's probably 10 or 12 foot diameter prop. There's that engine we were talking about. So this, this steam engine, was really a monstrosity. It was three stories tall. It was as high as a three-story house. Um, just a, a, a large, massive cast iron behemoth with all kinds of exposed moving parts, not like the engine in your car, okay, where it's all closed and you can't see inside. This had an open architecture, and uh, it was that way because there was a whole host of men that needed to keep it functioning, keep it oiled, keep it lubed, make sure that things were tight, um, adjustments made so it always ran tip top shape. The propeller we just looked at would be way off the screen to the left. And this was the drive shaft that uh, at the bottom, the base of the engine that would power that. Now, if we swim up a little bit, get about 25, 30 feet up off the bottom of the lake, we can see that this thing is still going up towards the top. Um, like I said, 30 feet tall, just an amazing piece of, of machinery. And if you get up close to it, you can see that it is in fact metal because look at all the rusticles on it, it's rusting. But the other really interesting thing that I wanted to show you with this picture is this decorative sort of border and diamond inlays in the, in the iron here. Um, folks, that is purely aesthetic. Uh, there is no structural or mechanical reason whatsoever for that to be there. This comes from a time when, um, I think manufacturers of things took a little more pride in what they're building and money wasn't always necessarily the bottom line. I mean, they, you know, they, they took pride in the fact that they made steam engines for, for, for ships and they put that in there. So it looked nice. So kind of a cool thing. Here is a four image mosaic of that steam engine sitting three stories tall on the bottom of Lake Superior. I call these mosaics impossible images or impossible photos because uh, the water is just not clear enough to allow me to get far enough back away from it to take a picture like this all with one click and get the whole thing in frame because I'd be so far away that the the engine would just be this dark shadow kind of like blob in the distance. We wouldn't see any of these wonderful details in it. And so what I had to do is take four photos while I was much closer to the engine and then stitch them together into one photo in Photoshop by hand later after the trip was over and I was back home in my office. So um, this is sort of one of my specialties. I love doing mosaics and um, and we're going to look at a few more of these tonight, but that's why I call it the impossible image. Okay, we're going to stay in Lake Superior. I'm going to go to the other side of Isle Royale, take a look at a completely different type of vessel than what we've looked at so far, which is the Chester Congdon. It was what we think of like the Edmund Fitzgerald, a big, huge modern freighter. Now, the Fitzgerald was 729 feet long. This was only 532 feet, so it was a little bit shorter, but uh, for all intents and purposes, this is what we think of as a modern steel 
freighter. And um, Congdon was on the lakes for 11 years before she ran aground uh, when she was in dense fog at Canoe Rocks. And she was carrying 380,000 bushels of wheat from Thunder Bay, Ontario. So that's more than four times the cargo of the vessel we just looked at. That's a lot of stuff that this big freighter could, could carry. Two days after she was grounded on the reef, a storm came along, tore her in two, and she sank. And um, this wreck was the first on Lake Superior to be valued at over a million dollars. So I want you to pay special attention to this, the bow here. This is the part of the shipwreck that we're gonna look at right now. Um, this is my little animation of what happened when the storm came along, ripped the head clean off, spun 180 degrees around and slid back down the reef, sitting there on a, a steep upward angle, looking back up to the top, wondering where the rest of its body went as it slid down the other side of the reef. Now you can actually stand on these rocks in the middle of Lake Superior. So um, these reefs are a real danger up there. And as we sort of alluded to, I am not drunk. My camera, I, I'm holding it straight and level, guys. I promise this is the angle that it is looking up the reef at. Another mosaic image while I was on the bottom of, uh, this is about uh, 100 feet deep here, and we're looking at the back of the bow and it's pointing up the reef. This stuff on the right is associated steel and plate steel and parts of the hull that sort of came down with the head, I guess, when it got ripped off of the, the rest of the, the hull. This is the real testament to the power that we we're talking about with storms on the Great Lakes, being able to take half inch plate steel and just twist it up like an aluminum soda can. Um, that's no joke. That is how strong the wind and the waves uh, can be in the forces acting upon these, what we think of as unsinkable ships. And they are, that's just couldn't be further from the truth. They really are um, at, at the mercy of mother nature. So that was the Chester Congdon and we're gonna leave Isle Royale behind. And oh, incidentally, I like to mention this too. Isle Royale, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, is not part of Minnesota and it's not part of Canada and it's not part of Wisconsin. It actually belongs to Michigan. Anyways, okay, we're going to take a look at another wooden sailing ship, the Bermuda. She reportedly had two feet of water in her bilge when she began taking on her load of iron ore at Marquette, Michigan. She left and ran into a storm and pounding waves, plus the already badly leaking hull, forced her captain to seek shelter in Munising Bay, where in the middle of the night, unfortunately, she sank, sadly taking through crewmen with her. Uh, 13 years later, she was floated and towed to nearby Murray Bay by salvage crew where her lifting chains slipped and the vessel once again settled on the bottom of Lake Superior, although now in only 25 feet of water in a protected bay and relatively safe from the ravages of most of the storms and big ice that uh, Superior can throw at you. So it's still in pretty good shape considering how shallow it is. She was 10 years old when she sank the first time. Here in this photograph, a good friend of mine at the time, Reason, was demonstrating some breath hold diving or free diving. He's got those giant free diving fins on, but you can see the surface of the water here. I mean, the deck is maybe 10, 12 feet below the surface uh, and very nice uh, and close to the surface, allows sunlight to penetrate and play on the decks and a lot of algae grows on there. Here, my buddy Steve is sort of checking out the bow as it's coming at us. Um, I love this photo because the water is so murky. It almost looks like a pirate ship kind of coming out of a fog bank, right? Um, and the reason for the, all the murk in the water, and you can even see the sunlight rays coming down through the surface. The reason for that was that uh, this vessel is frequented by hundreds of uh, glass bottom tour boats every summer, bringing thousands of tourists to go see a shipwreck. If you know, if you can't dive, this the next best thing, right? And those boats are constantly being blown off the over from over the top of the wreck by wind and by currents, and so they have to keep 
turning their propellers and sort of jockeying around to stay in position. And what that does is it really kind of kicks up a lot of the silt and the sand from the bottom and it gets mixed up in the water and it kind of turns a little cloudy. So that's what we had going on that day. We got there and there was a tour boat over it. We had to anchor and hold off and wait for them to finish up. And by the time we got over to the wreck, got suited up, got in the water, uh, this is what we had. But you know what? I'm good with it. it looks cool. Also, if you've noticed these pictures of these wrecks in, in um, Lake Superior, there's no quagga mussels. I mean, not one. And that's because Lake Superior is the only one of the five Great Lakes yet to be inundated by the quagga mussels. Ontario, Erie, Huron, and Michigan have good gazillions of them, trillions of them. And, um, and we're going to talk even more about that later in some other photos. But uh, the beauty of diving in Lake Superior is you get to see the artifacts and the rusticles and everything else uh, without being coated in quagga mussels. You can see how these pieces were joined and fitted together and how they assembled the vessels. Um, and you wouldn't really be able to see that when you're looking at a, a, a shipwreck in one of the other Great Lakes. Picture on the left, we're inside the cargo hold looking up through the square cargo hatch and there's some missing deck boards too, but you can also see the iron ore left over from her original uh, vinyl cargo. And then the picture on the right is the leading edge or the cut water, the bow of the vessel. And um, I just, I, I like this photo because of the texture of the wood. You know, don't get to see that a lot when, when you're diving in Lake Michigan or, or Huron or whatever. One final parting image from the Bermuda, I call this a high-tech, no-tech picture because reasons holding his breath. He has no scuba gear on, so that's no-tech. And Steve's wearing what we call doubles, double tanks. It's the setup that you would typically use for a pretty deep dive because you need a lot more breathing gas. And um, my buddies and I always wore our doubles even when we were diving shallow, we, we, we wore them every time we dove, regardless of the depth, simply because it uh, helped us with muscle memory with where our gear is and everything else. And it was sort of a safety conscious thing. So Steve's wearing technical gear. So I call it high tech and no tech. But the other thing about this photo is Reason's a big guy. He's like 6'4", probably, you know, pushing 300 pounds and he's got giant man hands. Look how small his hand is compared to the thickness of that rudder. That is a huge, huge, heavy slab of wood. And of course, the rudder is what steers the ship. So this gives you a little bit of idea of the size of some of these vessels, these, these sailing ships, the, the schooners especially. We're going to leave Superior behind, and we're going to come down into our own home lake of Wisconsin. Uh, this was in my backyard for almost my entire life for 53 years and uh, I loved every minute of it. Lake Michigan's awesome. We're gonna talk about the Frank O'Connor, which was sort of, um, it was a freighter, but it was a wood freighter. So it wasn't like a modern steel freighter. Frank O'Connor was built in 1892 and she was one of three sisters. At 301 feet long, this vessel was definitely pushing the limits of wooden boat building, <clears throat> excuse me. They just couldn't make them any bigger than that. That was about as far as they could go uh, with wood. And so then they, the, the, the boat makers, the, the shipbuilders, excuse me, they started uh, using iron and then of course steel after that um, because iron proved to be too brittle. But uh, this was really kind of the heyday of the big wooden boats. After that, they started they started disappearing. At any rate, the 26 year old vessel was carrying 3000 tons of coal from Buffalo to Milwaukee when she caught fire up in the bow. And uh, cause of the fire is still unknown, but the ship had been carrying grain all season according to the manifest records. So the dust that was left behind and all the nooks and crannies was no doubt just like tinder. And if you've ever worked on a farm or spent any time around a farm, you know that the grain dust is very flammable, very uh, explosive, very dangerous. So she was 10 miles offshore when the fire started and the captain was hoping to run her aground so that maybe some of the vessel would be salvageable after the fire was put out but they didn't make it. They got within two miles of shore when the steering gear burned through and they no longer had any way of uh, directing its, its path. And so that's when the captain said enough is enough. 
called abandoned ship. They took to their lifeboats and they started rowing away. Well, the lighthouse keeper from nearby Cana Island Lighthouse saw this, uh, this burning inferno. Think of all that wood, right? 300 feet of wood. And, and he, he went out there in his motorboat and he started hooking up to the, the, the lifeboats and pulling these guys who were just rowing by hand to get them away from the burning hulk faster because I'm sure the heat coming off of this thing must have been just staggering. Anyways, reports have it that it could be seen burning well into the night. It did burn to the water line before what was left underwater sank. Uh, she also was powered by triple expansion steam engine way back here in the stern. And we're going to take a look at that in just a minute. Also, she had a 12, di 12 foot diameter prop, which that steam engine could turn at 85 RPMs. And here is that prop on the bottom. Now, this is a really shallow dive. It's only about 60 feet, six zero to the bottom of the lake at this point. There's a lot of debris here in the foreground and there's that propeller in the stern. Um, Steve is gonna shine his light on one of the blades. We're now directly behind it. Um, you're probably wondering, why did I turn the pictures green? Well, I didn't. That's how it looked the day we dove. Uh, probably a, a pretty healthy algae bloom going on in the water. And it was really fun. It was, it was like diving in the Emerald Sea up in British Columbia, which I've actually done and the water is green. Um, but yeah, this, this is uh, just the way it looked. This flat thing on the foreground and the picture on the right is actually the rudder, which has fallen away. There's that triple expansion steam engine, also about 25, 30 feet tall. So reach is almost halfway to the surface or, or probably, you know, halfway. And of course, the boilers that turned the water into steam that the steam engine was able to turn into mechanical energy to turn that prop. She had two of them, and here they are. We had pretty good visibility on this day, um, even though the water was green, probably 40 feet of visibility or so. So that's not too bad. And if you make the swim all the way up to the bow, we, we, we anchored and went in at the stern. So we had a football length field swim up to the bow and then the same swim back to get back to our, our anchor line. Uh, but if you, if you know, we, we made the swim and then if one does that, you're rewarded with a large pile of anchor chain and a very large anchor, not a wood stock anchor. This is a metal stock on the end of the anchor here, but it still has those nice big flukes. We're gonna come on down the coast just a little bit, get out of Door County. We're gonna go off of Two Rivers, Wisconsin for probably what I think is the most famous shipwreck in Lake Michigan. And that's the schooner Ralph Simmons, better known as the Christmas tree ship. Very famous in Chicago, very well known. It was um, a Yuletide tradition. Her captain, Captain Scheunemann, who also was called Captain Santa, used to bring Christmas trees from Michigan's Upper Peninsula every Yuletide season to Chicago Market on the river, sell them straight off the deck of the, the schooner, probably cut out the middleman and sold them for a, a real bargain. And he was certainly beloved by many, many Chicago families. There's been untold books and plays and stories written about this, this very famous Christmas tree ship, the Ralph Simmons. At any rate, they left Thompson Harbor in Michigan with over 5,000 trees aboard, stuffed into the holds and lashed to the deck and everywhere they could stick a Christmas tree, no doubt. Uh, it was reportedly somewhat overloaded. And on the 23rd of November, 1912, which is 110 years ago uh, in like, what, 13 days. So coming up on 110th anniversary of her sinking, she sailed straight into an early winter storm. And um, prior to the sinking, though, two crew and the yawl boat were washed overboard by a rogue huge wave. The vessel tried valiantly to reach safe harbor, uh, but they were unable to or we wouldn't be talking about her. And the only reason that we know any of this, because unfortunately all hands were lost, the only way we even know that two of their guys and their, their yawl boat were washed overboard and that they tried making safe harbor is because we found a message in a bottle. Well, we didn't, somebody did. Uh, yes, that's a real thing. They actually did do that. Uh, it was more common than you would think. And uh, that's what they said in there. 
Now the vessel wouldn't, it wouldn't be seen again until 1971 when she was found by Bayview, Wisconsin resident and shipwreck hunter Kent Bell Richard. So the pictures of the Ralph Simmons that we're gonna look at now, I want you to be aware that it's the absolute clearest water I've ever dove in, in, uh, in any of the Great Lakes or the world's oceans before or, or since. I've never seen water this clear. About 140 feet of visibility. Now, it wasn't this bright down there. It was pretty dark. I lightened these photos up so we could see, but the water was just incredibly clear. Now, this is about 170 feet deep. So um, that has something to do with the, the clarity of the water, but I've never seen it like this ever again since then. Um, just spectacular. We're up at the bow here, the pointy end, as I like to call it. Here's her windlass and some anchor chain wrapped around there. Um, if you ever want to see one of her absolutely massive anchors, if you're in Milwaukee at the Milwaukee Yacht Club downtown on the lakefront, just north of Summerfest grounds, it's right out in the front yard by their front door. Um, it, it's just massive. It's really a cool anchor. Anyways, we can still see the remnants of some of those Christmas trees and the cargo hold here after all these years. Pretty crazy. Another shot of the windlass and the bow. Here we're way, way out in front of the wreck. Um, all these big poles on the bottom, that's her masts. She had three masts, a forward, main, and mizzen, and they snapped off when she hit the bottom. She hit bow first, and all the masts sort of snapped forward, snapped off, and, and fell forward onto the lake bottom. The other thing of note in this photograph is those pesky quagga mussels that we're gonna keep talking about. Okay, if you see all these white, cl really clean, bright areas on the bottom, that's the natural bottom of Lake Michigan in this part of the lake. It's a mixture of sand and clay. Wherever you see dark spots, like the entire distance in the background here, that is just complete carpets of quaggas, literally like trillions upon trillions of these things. Nothing eats them. They cover every single thing and they just multiply. It's, um, they came in on the ballast tanks of, of cargo vessels from Eastern Europe when they came up the St. Lawrence Seaway into the Great Lakes and they would flush out their ballast tanks before taking on cargo. Apparently some of these things were in there at some point they get flushed out into a new home called Lake Michigan. They go, hey, we really like it here. Let's stay. And they proliferated. And that was back in the 1980s. And uh, they are actually, I guess, good for something. They're the reason the water is this clear. You would never see 140 feet from bow to stern ever without the help of these invasive bivalves. Um, Back in the 70s, before the quaggas were introduced to the Great Lakes system, the divers reportedly would say that if you could see your hand in front of your face or six feet, that would have been an absolutely beautiful, really good dive. That would have been great visibility. Well, um, obviously, as a photographer, I'm kind of glad that the quaggas showed up because look what we have here, the entire 125 foot long, three masted schooner sitting on the lake bottom. This is my favorite photo, by the way, and uh, it's probably been favorited on Pinterest about 10,000 times, literally. So you might see that around. Anyways, one parting shot from it. Here's a centerboard trunk, just like the Arabia had. Here's another one right here. Um, and she might have had a second one back here, I don't recall. All her deck boards are missing too, by the way, that they're a softer, different kind of wood and it rotted away a lot easier than the hull, which was made of uh, probably oak, which is a much tougher wood. So, and here's a, a boom, probably off the mizzen or maybe the main um, laying on the, the lake bottom here. So a lot of parts to this thing all over the place. Anyways, you're never going to see visibility. I don't even see visibility like that when I dive in Cozumel, Mexico. I mean, 80 degrees and 80 foot vis, it's as good as it gets. And, and I, you know, I, can you imagine my surprise? I get 170 feet down and boom, Lake Michigan. I, I saw that. It was pretty crazy. So we're going to sort of be right off of Milwaukee now. So we're really getting close to you guys, um, about three and a half miles outside of Milwaukee. The Prince Willem V was a modern day tragedy. It was a 258 foot long steel freighter 
and it was sailing for the Netherlands when it sank because it collided with a barge full of oil being towed behind a tugboat just outside of Milwaukee in 1954. So when I say modern day, um, in quotations, okay, there are still people alive who probably, you know, saw the lights on the horizon from the shoreline that night in October 1954, but um, a relatively modern day uh, tragedy. At any rate, it wasn't that big a tragedy because nobody died, thankfully. Uh, all 29 souls aboard survived, but there was, I believe, there have been four deaths of scuba divers diving the shipwreck since it's been on the bottom. Now, the other interesting thing, speaking of being on the bottom, this wasn't the first time this vessel went to the bottom of a body of water. It actually sank in uh, Rotterdam Harbor in the Netherlands in 1944, I think, when it, it was still under construction when the Germans invaded the Netherlands and uh, they sort of took possession of it and they never got a chance to finish it. And then when the Allies um, started liberating Europe and taking back the Netherlands, the German army retreated. They dynamited the unfinished Prince Wilhelm V, put it on the bottom of Rotterdam Harbor, hoping to blockade the waterway and aid in their escape. This was a five-year-old vessel. It was her 25th trip to the region. All she did was sail back and forth between Europe and the Midwest through the Great Lakes. That's all. That was her job. So relatively young vessel. Here she is coming straight at us. Again, I'm holding my camera straight, I promise. She's just leaning over on her right side that far. Um, great visibility, 80 feet or so, I'd say. This is one of her two loading masts, uh, a mast that would have booms and cranes on it and they could load their bulk cargo in through the cargo hatches. Again, these quagga mussels just covering everything. It was also the, that was, that last photo was my very first ever magazine cover. So I'm very proud of that. And it was a three image mosaic as well. Anyways, here's the bow. We're a few feet uh, away from the bow now, but we're still up at the bow. And there's that mass that we saw earlier, sort of leaning out over the sand. I want you to take a look at this dark shape here on the right hand side. That's about a six foot high cliff. That's created from water currents moving around the, the sunken vessel and carving out the clay and sand bottom of Lake Michigan. And it kind of just keeps getting a little deeper, a little deeper. It just keeps settling in. The hull just keeps on going and into the, into the sand and the clay here underneath the sand and clay. So um, we're going to see that again in another photo. We're about halfway towards the, we're at the middle of the ship, I guess, and this is the pilot house. This is where the captain was not standing when it struck the towed barge. Uh, he should have been on the bridge. They had just left Milwaukee's Harbor. They were about two miles out. It was dark. It was October. There were five to six foot waves. And believe it or not, they did not even have their radar turned on. So keep in mind, this is 1954. Things were a little different back then. Safety protocols weren't such a big deal. You'd never, as a ship captain, ever get away with that. In today's world, you know, leaving a harbor with perfectly functioning radar and not having it on just because, I don't know, you forgot to flip it on or you were feeling macho and thought you didn't need it. I don't know. But um, just a big oops there. My friend Dirk is shining his light on the pilot house windows where the captain should have been standing. So this really does show that 70 degree angle that it's sitting on its right side, but we're gonna swim with Dirk underneath and behind the smokestack, which is this big block on top of the cabin roof here. And we're gonna go underneath and behind that. See, there's that smokestack on the right. This is the engine room skylight. And what it was, was, sort of served dual purpose, I think. It, it allowed natural light to get down deep into the bowels of the ship where the engine was located, but it also was a way of being able to crane big heavy parts that you couldn't physically carry off the ship up and down in case you know, the, the, the engine needed to be overhauled or something like that, or a part malfunction had to be replaced. You could get in and out through that. Well, getting in and out through that is not, too easy if you're a diver wearing double technical gear like Dirk is here. 
But if you're wearing a single scuba tank, you can actually squeeze through one of these openings. And Brian and I did that on another dive. And we sort of made our way down about three decks into the bowels of the ship. Now, because it's on its side, making our way down through three decks meant that we were actually kind of swimming horizontally, if you think of it that way. But we were moving down in decks in the ship. Well, these vessels, uh, the Prince Willem's been down for um, coming on 70 years now, 68 years, and it's accumulated a lot of silt inside. And um, it's hard to move around in here. There's things like this big cabinet that's fallen. And, you know, I mean, it's getting old and it's, it's decaying. So things fall away. And you have to sort of crawl through tight spots and you can't help but kick up some of this silt and the big, this, this silt is, it just, when there's no current, it just keeps big, getting into like a big mushroom cloud and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger until it, it envelops everything and you can't see anything. So that's one reason why diving inside shipwrecks is very hazardous. But about three seconds after I snapped this photo, a huge cloud that we had been sort of dragging with us as we were crawling down to get to this point to do this photo shoot sort of caught up with us. And then it enveloped Brian and I and the photo shoot was over and we had to get out of there. But this is the top of the engine. These are the five cylinders. It was a five cylinder diesel. And that's the size of those cylinder heads. Just ma massive. <laughs> Pardon me. Here we are inside of one of our four cargo holds and Brian is swimming over the top of some 55 gallon drums were, which were part of the original cargo when she sank in 54. Excuse me, uh, right, yes, 54. This, we're, we're looking out of an opening here in the deck. It's 20 foot square by 20 foot. And uh, here's one of those clay cliffs, sort of the lake bottom that uh, the, the water currents keep carving out. The most impossible photo <laughs> I've ever put together, actually, I'm most proud of this of any photo I think I've ever taken, took 55 individual still photographs stitched together by hand in Photoshop, about 40 hours worth of work to make this image happen. It's the only image in existence of the 258 foot freighter in its entirety sitting on the bottom of Lake Michigan. And just for size reference, all these little shiny silver things are scuba diving tanks and their bubbles, of course, you can see racing to the surface. Uh, this is about 80 feet deep, 80, 85 feet deep to the sand here. So um, nice and shallow. You can see the cargo holds, these big square openings. There's one, there's two, three, and four. The smokestack that we looked at earlier, the engine room skylight window, and also the pilot house was right underneath here. And of course, are two loading masts coming straight at us. So really love that. Um, I've been on this shipwreck. Oh, I probably dove it 60 times or more in my life. Um, it was sort of our hometown wreck and uh, sometimes dove it twice a week. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. The St. Albans is a little bit older than the Prince, Al uh, Prince Willem. St. Albans was a small wooden steamer and it would ferry people and package goods back and forth between Wisconsin and Michigan. That's what its job was that 80 mile trip one way back and forth between Wisconsin and Michigan. And um, January of 1881, she was leaving Milwaukee, headed for Michigan, wasn't too far out, rammed into some ice and put a big hole in the bow. Water starts flooding in, of course, they know this, they, they're aware of it. So they turn around, they try to make it back to port, but you guessed it, we're talking about it, so they didn't make it. Um, they, I think there was, yes, 27 people aboard. Now everybody survived the ordeal, thankfully, by rowing their lifeboats to shore. They were 15 miles out. Okay, put that math together in your head. 15 miles worth of rowing a big heavy lifeboat. That must have been an ordeal in itself, but at any rate, they were alive. Uh, so <clears throat> unfortunately there was a cow and a calf aboard this vessel when it sank and they perished when they were unable to launch their own lifeboat because they had hooves and not thumbs. Ouch, little dark diver humor there. Okay, I'm sorry, don't throw fruit. Anyways, here she is coming straight at us. 
on the bottom of Lake Michigan, about 165 feet deep. Again, there's some correlation to the better viz and the depth. The bow is a little broke up. She's kind of been uh, separated from the rest of the hull, which is receding away into the mist in the background. And Steve is swimming up the port side, shining his light. But the other thing that you should take note of is the debris field. And we have incredible visibility on this dive, but look at all the stuff. Here's her mast lying right here. And there's some wall panels, um, just stuff everywhere. Here's her uh, windlass, if, if you want to think of it as that. Now, as a photographer of shipwrecks, typically there are two uh, points on a shipwreck that are most often going to give you the best bang for your buck, the most interest. And that's going to be the bow and the stern. I like to call it the pointy end and the round end. And we were just at the pointy end. Now we're at the round end. This is the stern and we're looking forward. So the bow is off in the distance now. Steve's about ready to swim over one of the parts to the smokestack. And uh, again, the debris field, it's just extensive. I don't know that I've ever <clears throat> dove a wreck that had a bigger debris field than the St. Albans when I stopped to think about it. Anyways, it was a steam engine powered vessel as well. Here's the steam engine and other assorted equipment uh, that went along with that. This big winch thing on the rear deck, that was called a capstan. That was probably used to raise and lower the stern anchor when they needed to, or pull in mooring lines or do any kind of other heavy lifting. It probably would have been steam operated. So it would have been a nice big power winch. Two of my favorite photos, the bow and the stern. Um, the one on the left is, is absolutely my favorite, my favorite image of this vessel, uh, just because of the the, the incredible visibility we had. The one on the right, Steve shining his light on the propeller and the rudder. And uh, I'm just going to go backwards just for a moment. If you take a look at the edge of my point cursor pointer there, there's a like a white dot. That's Steve's camera, which he laid on the deck when he came down the line and realized that when he turned it on that the batteries were dead. He never charged the batteries the night before. So rather than push a big heavy camera around underwater, he just left it there. So he'd pick it up on the way back when we were done with our dive, which meant that he was dedicated to being my sole dive model for the whole night, not just taking pictures uh, of the vessel too. So that was good. It worked out great for me. And he was pretty upset because we had such good visibility and he missed out. He's a great photographer, by the way, too, on his own right. Last one for the night, folks. This is the Car Ferry, Milwaukee. This is about seven miles north of the city of Milwaukee. It's off of Fox Point. It was lost on October 22nd, 1929, um, just a week before the financial tempest that ushered the nation into the Great Depression, which, of course, a storm of a different kind sent the Car Ferry, Milwaukee, to the bottom of the lake while it was attempting to leave Milwaukee and go to Grand Haven, Michigan. That was its job, go back and forth between Milwaukee and Grand Haven, carrying railroad cars. When I say car ferry, I mean railroad box cars, not, not automobiles. Um, she, like so many other tales, had a really tough time and turned around and decided to try and go back to Port Milwaukee, but they didn't make it. And again, we found this out days later or weeks later because a message in a bottle was found saying that um, the crew roster was about the same as last trip. So we don't know for sure, but it's an estimated at 46 lives lost. Everybody died when this vessel sank. Um, a lifeboat did show up on the shores of Michigan, of Lake Michigan at Michigan, 80 miles across with some frozen bodies in it. So they almost made it out. Uh, unfortunately, they did not. They, we think the cause of the sinking was this big door that's in the up position right now, but would be in the down position would be covering sort of the, uh, the really low deck where the rail cars were rolled onto the vessel. And apparently, according to the message in the bottle, very, very large waves were coming at it from the stern and it bent that seagate, that metal door so badly that it was no longer sealing and keeping water out. And so water started flooding over the decks that the cars were sitting on that had big grates in them, which the water then went down into lower decks and, and the ship just flooded that way. At any rate, here she is, 331 foot steel hulled, massive 
twin propeller ship coming straight at us on the bottom, about 120 feet deep. And Dirk and Mike are swimming right across the bow. Here's her mast. This is the very stern, the opposite end. This is a huge Seagate, this big metal thingy that got bent up like a pretzel. That's what's supposed to be flat and straight and covering this. And by the way, you can see the rails that the cars would roll onto the deck on uh, at the edge of the deck there. The shadow is kind of covering up the propellers, but she had two massive propellers, a port and a starboard side. And um, here's a better look at one of those. That's the starboard prop and prop shaft. And Brian is shining his light on the prop shaft, showing you that 12 foot diameter propeller. The reason I love this photo so much is because this is a place I always tried to go to whenever I dove this wreck. I've probably been on this wreck 20 or 25 times in my life. Um, it's sitting on top of a railroad car truck. Now a truck is a wheel set. That's those wheels that the box cars sit on top of. They weren't permanently attached. If you crane, if you took a crane and picked the box car up, the wheels would still sit on the rails. And so when one of the cars came off the ship in the ordeal, these wheel sets, which are all just cast iron, would have it probably would have you know taken two seconds or less to go straight to the bottom uh, of the lake, and just like a paperweight. And I just find it ironic that something that once was sitting on top of the ship, the ship is now sitting on top of it. So the ship just, you know, by a fluke of whatever comes to rest on top of that wheel set, which is just crazy, but I always like to go see that. Um, Brian is shining his light on the starboard hoss holes. Here she is coming straight at us. This was a single image, not a mosaic. We had really good visibility that day. And um, this was also a full page photo in Scuba Dive Magazine many years ago. But that shows you how, you know, here's Brian and here's this three-story tall bow, just a really large ship. And if you swim about 80 feet off the port bow, this is sitting on the sand. Remember in the beginning, we were talking about the Manasu and how wooden structures would blow off sometimes or be, be separated from the vessel as it was sinking. Well, this was one of those times. This is the pilot house. This is where Captain Heavyweather McKay would have been standing uh, his last minutes before getting wet and then dying on as his ship went down. And this huge room, it's a big room, wooden room. These are all wooden structures. Behind the pilot house was the chart house. And uh, it all blew off as a single unit, probably floated on the surface for a couple of minutes, maybe longer before it finally sank and came to rest about 80 feet away from the rest of the vessel. If this wasn't almost a night dive, and if the visibility was just a little better, we'd see the shipwreck as a big shadow in the background. Um, but this light coming from inside there, that's not a tr trick of Photoshop. We, years ago, my buddies and I started experimenting with what we call off-camera lighting, where we take a floodlight and uh, one that's not attached to our camera and place it in certain parts on the ship or around the ship to try and add interest to our photos like this one here. So it looks like it's kind of haunted. Um, I gave this talk at Halloween just a few weeks ago and it was really appropriate for that as well. So anyways, that's the car ferry Milwaukee. These are the wrecks that I've dove around the Great Lakes. I've been on over a hundred shipwrecks in my life. Um, about 70 or 75 of them in the Great Lakes, the others in the world's oceans. And uh, this, is, this is where all my disposable income went over 20 years, traveling to all these uh, remote places. Shipwrecks, a lot of times, just like to sink at really remote places. So you spend a lot of time in flea bag motels and a lot of time driving in the car with your buddies, thinking about the dives you're going to do or talking about the dives you just did. And, um, and so anyways, that was great. But if you'd like to see more ship wreck photos and even shipwreck art. As I said before, I am an artist too, and I do a lot of shipwreck art for magazines, uh, for book covers, for museums and things of that nature. Please go to my website, www.calsworld.net. And uh, you can also help fund my next expedition by buying some art or photograph from my website as well. And all proceeds, I am self-funded. 